Continuing our look at the Legend of Zelda series, we are now up to Zelda 2. Uh, a movie game that is not necessarily as popular or as well known as the first one, but also tried several new things and established several new trends that the series would take going forwards. G continuing the analogy of, the, of Toy Story 1 being Zelda 1. And don't worry, I've already picked out what LTTP and Ocarina is. We'll get there when we get there. This was pitched in mid-95, which was just a little bit before Toy Story was actually coming out. Disney decided to go ahead and exercise their second film option and pick it up, so that's two down now. And Andrew Stanton was effectively kind of pulled out of the Toy Story team, remember he had helped write Toy Story a little bit, and kind of put in charge of this one a little bit. This was kind of a... an. an what they were attempting to do was what most film companies do. There's usually like an A team and a B team, and in some cases a C team, right? So this was an attempt to kind of grow a B team under Stanton. Uh, Stanton was still only co-director and co-writer and co-producer and blah, 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 blah. But this was his first foray into getting the, the feel for those kind of responsibilities and that kind of creative control so that he can then start doing his own works, which he would obviously eventually do. He's also the one who is personally responsible for turning the story in its, on its head into something that would actually be you know, worthwhile. The original idea was these circus folk show up, and they're just liars. They're just like, yeah, we're here. Okay, we're out. Peace. And then the ants are like, no. And then the circus people are like, okay, fine, we'll turn around. And everyone felt that that lacked a certain oomph. It was his idea to bring in the misunderstanding about Flick make Flick no longer be a red ant, who was part of the circus, but instead part of the original colony, and then have Flick pull them in as mercenaries, and thus we have the events of the film. It's another thing they did around this point in time, though. They did, uh... They had a lunch meeting, and this was an extensive meeting where they sh workshopped ideas, vague ideas, of course, for story stuff, because... All, obviously, they were all hoping Toy Story would be successful enough in order to keep making films. And remember, they did have those options with Disney that Disney ended up using, one of which on this one. So they were like, okay, what else do we want to do? And they started talking around a team and sitting around a table, and you probably already see where I'm going with this. It doesn't really come up in this film. Arguably, it doesn't even come up in the next film. But this is the second time in which the Pixar team has sat down in a group and, you know, shoved ideas around at each other and basically just brainstormed. And they came up with several concepts. Again, concept films being Pixar's big wheelhouse. In this case, they came up with A Bug's Life, Monsters, Inc., and uh, Finding Nemo, the base concepts of each of those films, right there at that particular meeting. Now... <laughs> Uh, why bugs? Why they choose bugs next? Well, two big reasons. First of all, they weren't stupid. I know, shocking. One of the things many creative minds have done over the years is they'll make A to make B. They need to gain the, the familiarity with the technology and the coding and the processing and the design and the experience and get the financial backing and blah, 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 blah. This happens all the time in books, television, movies, etc. Oh, and video games. Uh, sweet it in one to sweet it in two is probably one of the most clear-cut examples of this I've ever seen. In this case, A Bug's Life was intended to be one of those. Oh, obviously they did want to make the film, and they wanted to make it as good as they can, but in many ways, A Bug's Life was being made so that they could build up to other ideas. And of the many ideas they had, which I just named three, they sat down and said, what well, seems to me that bugs would be the easiest to literally do right now. You know, they're still kind of plasticine. They're still not really super involved. They would actually finally start employing subsurface scattering in this one, which is an oft-talked-about uh, 3D rendering model, which has actually been around since the 70s, but hasn't really been used to great effect until probably about Toy Story 2, I'd say. And maybe not that specific film, but around that era. It's the way of making human beings and otherwise uh, more complex textures and surfaces look like something other than plastic or metal. And you notice that while they start using that in this film, it still looks like plastic and metal. But that's okay, because bugs. Because that was the whole reason why they decided to use bugs for this particular one. Cool. They're still pushing the tech, though. And that's part of the point I'm re mentioning. Remember, most of the Pixar team, especially at this point in history... They're the tech geeks. They're the people who wanted to make CGI stuff because they wanted to make CGI stuff. Again, 
if you're paying attention to my massive dissertation last 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 week, uh, this is going back uh, over a decade at this point, almost a decade and a half actually at this point. So, how do we do this? Well, remember that this film was kind of in the early parts of pre-production before Toy Story came out. Oh, Toy Story was effectively finished by the time they started working on this film, because that's how filmmaking works. I mean, I talked about that during the Disney Renaissance, when they were often working on three or four films simultaneously, depending on which point in history we were talking. But here... While they believed Toy Story would be successful enough, they were they nobody expected Toy Story to be the smash hit. Remember me talking about that? So Pixar wasn't a big name yet, CGI animation wasn't a big thing yet, and they didn't really have the power, politically or financially, to really pull in what they would want with regards to several elements of the movie. So when it came to casting, they went heavily on television stars. Now, there are some exceptions here, but Almost universally, television stars, even big-name television stars, just don't make the kind of money that film stars do. In fact, television in general is lower tier in terms of finances than film, at least amongst Hollywood. Whether it should be or not is a much more complex problem. Let's just ignore that for the moment. Especially in the 90s, it was absolutely true. I mean, it's true today. It is only within the last five years, seven years by the time this video goes goes out, because I do these well in advance, that uh, television started to get big budget. I suppose you could argue it goes back a little bit or further than that, but I stand by my statement. Point being, they wanted to hire people that were going to be cheaper. So, they bring in all kinds of TV stars. I'm not going to give you the whole list. Just just look at the list of people involved. This, uh, this is all cool. Um, oh, right. Sorry, I actually forgot about this. I was going to start with this. I do apologize. Uh, it was requested of me to give the full, in-depth, and extensive history of Luxo. Now, for those of you not familiar, Luxo is the lamp towards the beginning of the little things. He actually had a short at one point. Now, back in about 1838, there was this situation that was happening. Now, all of the lanterns throughout all of the London underground were all being developed on screen in a manner that finally matched the vision of Sir Ancelus Frankton, the 32nd. Now, this is why they actually called him Junior rather than his senior compatriot. <sighs> okay. Oh, hang on just a second. Hmm. Okay. Sorry that took so long. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and move on towards talking about office politics, which, I mean, I know we just discussed a whole lot of that, but let's go ahead and discuss even more office politics, shall we? Now, Katzenberg is not a great person. I've talked about this before. While the man does have some credit to him, and I will always respect the credit he deserves, see the Disney Renaissance and the Toy Story thing that I've already talked about, the man was always a political shark when it came to office politics, and he liked to play office politics way too much, and almost always to the detriment of the actual creative works. Let me go ahead and summarize we don't know. Let, let, let's just start with that. Everyone says something different, and what facts we have could be interpreted in a whole number, a whole slew of different ways. So all we know is that A Bug's Life was set to release at the same time as Prince of Egypt, which was DreamWorks' launching film. And so DreamWorks started working on... Sorry, sorry. Nope. See, I'm slanting it. I do have my own opinion here, obviously. So let's... Period. End sentence. Start new sentence. Ants, A-N-T-Z, was being worked on relatively at the same time as A Bug's Life. It's also worth noting that there is a decent... So, and, and let, let's stop, 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 stop. That's the facts, okay? Now, you can take from that whatever you want. However, we do have recorded phone calls of people talking to Katzenberg, and Katzenberg trying to wheel and deal with people. Katzenberg himself, his, himself has denied this. But as I've said before, given the man's pattern of office politics, I believe with 100% certainty that he was starting development on, on Ants specifically to try and push back against Disney and Pixar. It is also worth noting that the man had a long-standing, uh, true or not, uh, belief that people at Disney were out to get him. I actually talked about this during the Disney Renaissance videos as well. And that clearly influenced his decision-making at several points in time. It's also worth noting that Eisner, who was a dick, was probably actually involved in several of those things, and probably actually was, or at least someone under him, was actually trying to push against Katzenberg. I mean, if nothing else, Schneider was, right? 
So make of that what you will. But I will say this. Did Disney deliberately put the release of A Bug's Life against a Prince of Egypt? Absolutely. Of course they did. That's not even unusual. <laughs> I mean, that's semi-normal. Did uh, Katzenberg steal the core concepts for A Bug's Life for Ants? Again, yes. I, I believe that with total certainty, especially since Katzenberg was fully in on the no and was someone people would bounce ideas off of and feedback off of, per his request, by the way repeatedly, and was still at Disney when Pixar was workshopping and dealing with working on A Bug's Life. So he absolutely had the information and access to it. Is Ants a ripoff of Bug's Life? No, it's a completely different film. Anybody who's seen it can tell you immediately that the two films have nothing to do with each other, other than the extremely surface level, you know, one has to do with Ants and the other has to do with Ants. That's, that's about it, as far as similarities between the two. I know you can get nitpicky, but I stand by that statement otherwise. Nevertheless, that was not a strong showing for DreamWorks. And if I ever discuss the Shrek block, which I know several people are pushing for happening next year, don't worry, it'll be a little shorter than the Pixar block. Uh, that is something that I do plan to bring up, because DreamWorks didn't do so well in its initial launching. And frankly, Katzenberg is probably at least part of why. Nevertheless, this film actually did get released much more expensive, 120 million budget. Some of that was spent on marketing, but actually most of it was spent just on straight up tech. Remember, they were interested in doing CGI and they felt like Toy's Life wasn't, there's Toy's Life, excuse me, Toy Story wasn't good enough. And they were right. No one felt intended. There was some good animation there and it was remarkable for the time, but Zelda won. So they wanted to push the tech further because they felt like it still wasn't where they wanted to be. They just wanted to get on with making movies. Again, the Phantom Menace problem. So they pumped a huge amount of money into the research, the development, the hardware, the CGI, and the techniques that they used, in, excuse me, in the rendering, and the techniques they used in order to actually make these things happen. That is why the budget of this film is so much higher, despite the fact that initially the budget was so much lower. But because Toy Story was such a smash success, they were able to cycle so much of that money back into the company to develop the technology to the point where Pixar would eventually become Pixar. Some people say that that started with this film. I am not in a position to disagree. The animation bump from Toy Story to Pug A Bug's Life is noticeable. I would personally argue that the next film we'll be covering, Toy Story 2, is when it really started to jump forward. But if I'm being completely honest with myself, because everything's a gradient, right? Like Picking a specific point on the gradient is always hard. If I had to pick the point when the CGI got really impressive, it would actually be Monsters, Inc., which we will discuss when we get there, of course. Either way, this film still made $363 million, so more than made the budget back and continued to prove the formula. This is the the success story, really. While Toy Story 2 would arguably be, well, actually Finding Nemo would be the success story, but while many Pixar films would keep reiterating this point over and over, it is worth noting that this is very important from a financial side of things. If you make a really good product and it sells well, then you make another one and it doesn't, what you have is a problem. Because even if the second work is better than the first, the people who make decisions, the group of individuals I collectively refer to as the money people, just to save time, because the actual roles and titles vary from company to, to institution, the money people will look at those sales figures and the return on investment and say, hmm, and what we can have happening is a bit of self-fulfilling prophecy here, which is funny because this very film addresses that topic. Some, you know, the technology, the technological advances that Flick is trying to push, everyone presumes aren't going to work, so they don't give it the proper chance and backing, which means the technological f progress doesn't happen. Yeah. So, thankfully, A Bug's Life sold well, because otherwise people could have looked at to uh, uh, Toy Story like a fluke. In fact, if you've been paying attention, just to tie this into all the movies I'm covering this year, Robert Zemeckis almost had that exact same problem with uh, Romancing the Stone, where everyone uh, thought it, it was just a fluke that he had made, uh, oh God, uh, used cars. That's it, used cars. And then everything else he made was crap. Romancing the Stone proved them wrong, which got us back to the future. And that's exactly my point. The initial is fine. That's the starting point, but it really is just the first step. You need to prove the formula works, 
prove that you can repeat it, then people give you backing. Then you get the funding. Then you get the support, the tools, the tech, the resources, the time. Then you can actually make stuff. This is one of the reasons why we tend to focus so much on individual companies that have managed this exact process. Because the overwhelming majority of other companies and individuals over history have not. There's plenty of people and groups and individuals who have made one great film or one great game or one great show, and then it is much harder to make one and then prove it and then continue. Those three steps. And that is the Pixar success story in a nutshell. Because Toy Story, A Bug's Life, Toy Story 2. Anyways. Sorry for going off on that topic, but I wanted to discuss the financial behind the scenes there. I know that's really, really surface level, and I apologize. I, I try to tone it back with the financial talk, because I know that that can get into whoo, territory very quickly. Anyways, let's talk about the movie. So, the initial shot is important. Now, there are two areas in this film that are not shown in the initial shot. When we start way out there with the island, and then we slowly zoom in on the island until we get to the point where we actually see the ants. This is actually a very important cinematic technique. Some of you may remember this from Star Wars A New Hope. Again, earlier this year, I talked about this exact same thing with Rogue One, which pulled the same trick. (sighs) Scale and scope only matter if you have some kind of relative uh, comparison point. If you're looking at something and you don't have anything to compare it to, you, you, you just, your mind is not really processing it the same way. But if you look at something and then you see this little dot in the distance and someone's like, yeah, that over there, that's a car. And then it's like, and all of a sudden your, your perspective on the whole picture you're looking at completely changes. So knowing that perspective is important. So they give us this tiny island. This thing can't be more than five feet wide. Maybe. Maybe two meters, if we want to really stretch it, like at the outside. Dinky little spit of land in the middle of what's probably like a meadow or a park or something like that. But that's important, because now we have an understanding of exactly where we're going to be, and the, uh, what do I call that? The, there's, there's a visual continuity to it. Because visual continuity is actually usually more important for video games, but it's important for movies too. Because it's important for the audience to know what is in relative to where, so that we know what is all in relation to everything else. We can have like a mental map of what we're looking at as we're going through the film. And for a film like this, where the overwhelming majority of the action all takes place on this tiny, dinky little island, that's doubly important. So we get the sense of the scale, and we now have the visual geography in our minds. Two brilliant moments right there. The only areas that aren't really here is the city, which is over by the pizza guy's place (laughs) and his uh, trailer, and wherever it is that the grasshoppers hang out during the summer months. Probably further south. Just random guess, given the mariachi music. Anywho. So. The... What? Oh, yeah. So, uh, why is the tribute platform right on the edge of the glyph is that am i the only person who's bothered by that i'm gonna go and admit something i like this film i do but if i was to rate the pixar films a bug's life would be closer to the bottom and i'll try to explain why as i go but i feel like the script is just not particularly strong which is funny because i said the same thing about toy story one Again, they're still trying to get their processes going, and they've only started, just barely started, the the methods that they would eventually employ to good effect when it comes to script writing. But anywho. So, tribute's right there on the edge. Rowdy, Roddy McDowell, I want to mention him really quick here. He shows up as uh, Mr. Soil, his last role. And he's, you know, the the bugs, a leaf falls. And first of all, context... A leaf is a terrifying thing to a bug, sure. So there's also the fact that they're lost. Oh, God, how do we get around it? This is actually relatively close to real life. Although in real life, the ants would just then find a new route around without having the other person to guide them. But it's still, well, well, it gets across some nice little thing. And it shows the very beginnings of Pixar's incessant intention on research. Because Pixar research is something they would become very, very known for, most notably in Finding Nemo. But here, it also helps to serve a point. These people are dinosaurs. Now, I'm going to explain that really quick. There's something I call dinosaur mentality. Dinosaur mentality is when you just slog forward, doing the same thing you've always done over and over without ceasing. It is a form of traditionalism. 
Um, you might even say it is a form. What the heck? Uh, it's it's a form of stubbornness as well. You know, refusal to change, right? And that is these people in a nutshell. They are so wigged out that they can't take the tiniest little interruption in their lives. This is then further reinforced by Princess Ada, who is freaking out and wigging out because, uh, well, <laughs> there's obviously the fact that she's new to this, but the problem is every tiny little thing that goes wrong sends her off into hysterics. To the point where she's having trouble even functioning. The queen, the actual queen, takes charge several times. But even she is shown multiple times as being completely traditionalist. Just keep all that in mind. We also see... Uh, hang on. We also see how calm and lighthearted this whole sequence is. This is important. The lighting is bright. The colors are sharp and well contrast each other. You know, they're very poppy. Um, there's the like joking tone they've got going on. And as they're talking about this, they casually normally reference their oppressors who are showing up to take their tribute soon. And while they're talking about this, the camera follows them in front of them and slowly pans up until we could see the giant pile of food that they're gathering for the, the people that are coming to oppress them. Nice touch. Good world building, much better than the first film. And they're getting across several narrative beats very quickly and efficiently. So you can see how the storyboarding has certainly gotten better. We also see Dot. And I don't know how I never knew this before. Dave Foley plays Fick. Flick. I think the reason I didn't know this before is because I didn't really watch any of his stuff until years later a friend of mine introduced me. And I was just like, hey, wait, that's Flick? And that was pretty much how that one went. He does a very good job in this. This is uh, this is where the, they irritate me a little bit. Now, I'm not so much anti-traditionalist as I am pro-use-your-brain. Now, if you do something, and you do something because it works, then that's fine. You're doing it because it works, and that's cool. If you're doing something, but someone introduces another idea which is improved in some way, then you should probably consider using the new way. That's That's just the way I tend to think in general, right? Now, all of these ants are obviously extremely, severely traditionalist. Dinosaurs, like I already mentioned. But what's doubly irritating is there's another little thread here. I have a feeling the individualism was intended to be a theme of this film. There's a bit where they flat out say, why don't you just go and gather the food like everyone else? Yeah, like everyone else. God, that guy's such a weirdo. Allow me to be bold and say that I don't think that's actually a theme or message that is in the film. It may have been intended, but I don't think it got to the final print. There are two themes I think are present, and I've already said one of them, the traditionalism thing, and how we could push against that. I'll talk more about that later. So, we see how his inventions do work, but, well, this kind of goes back into that self-defeating thing. How many of you have ever been in a circumstance or situation where you have such a low self-esteem that you effectively hurt your own ability to do what it is you're trying to do. And then you get embarrassed by it because there's people watching and judging you silently, of course. And then in some cases, they're not judging you silently. They're judging you openly. And they make it worse because they grind you down. What are you doing? Why are you driving this way? Okay. This is really embarrassing. One time I was driving my step-parents home from the airport. Now, I've driven to that airport many times myself and from that airport many times myself. And I'm a good driver. But they kept nitpicking my route and being irritable about it, and that freak wigged me out a bit to the point where I took the wrong turn, which wigged me out even more and made them make fun of me even more until I went the wrong way again. And it turned into this whole thing. How many of you have ever been there? Now, to this day, I'm embarrassed by that because there's no cause for that. I, I'm in my 30s, for God's sakes. I shouldn't be getting wigged out just because they're getting judgmental, right? I made one mistake, but I let it get to me. But the only reason I let it get to me is because, well, because they were they were grinding me down, right? It's the low self-esteem thing. And this is obviously immediately relevant to the film, isn't it? The idea of, oh, God, what's... It's Flick again. I can't wait for him to make another mistake. And, the, and in the background... During a later scene, we actually hear that this has happened before. But if you pay attention to exactly what they're saying, it's made clear that the incidents weren't really his fault. He had good ideas that were badly implemented and 
weren't supported. And hey! And you see the self-defeating prophecy thing again. So he ruins everything. And there goes a ton of food. Why is it on the edge of the cliff? I mean, I know the answer to this. I'll tell you the answer right now. Because it's always been at the edge of the cliff. That's where they put it. That's how they do things. I'm dead serious. Later on in the film, they rebuild the tribute thing right there in the same spot previously because that's where they do things. So, lots of food is wasted. And the locusts, sorry, grasshoppers show up. Now, (laughs) remember everything I talked about how everything audibly and visually and in dialogue were all, and in voice acting, were all showcasing the lighthearted tone? Well, then the grasshoppers show up and all of that is flipped. The colors go more muted and more, uh, not bleached out, uh, saturated or desaturated, I guess. They, they, everything gets darker and cooler and everything gets quieter and there's more ominous tone to it and everyone's terrified and blah, blah, blah. Because the grasshoppers are here. They're the villains in case you missed it. But it is a good visual and audible contrast. I'm going to go ahead and share something. Pixar actually wanted to do something with the grasshopper and the ant. The problem was Disney already did that quite a while ago, admittedly, but still. And so they looked at that and said, well, we can't just do that. Well, what can we do? Now, the story basically stops there. Allow me to continue with pure conjecture, and this is all entirely speculation. I think this is a sequel to The Grasshopper and the Ant. The Grasshopper goes in and offers his singing and you know assistance to the, the ants, and the ants help feed him, and everyone's cool, and then a generation passes, and then two, and then three, and now it's habit and norm that the grasshoppers come and take the food that the ants have produced. <sighs> kind of dark, admittedly, but this is actually a really dark film. This is when we're introduced to Hopper. We find out the first rule of leadership, which is everything is your fault, you know, the truth. And we get a lot of exposition, once again, in a very efficient period of time here. Hopper is big and intimidating and terrifying, but the grasshoppers in general are just thugs. I mean, the the gang buddies, the cronies that follow around after Biff over in the Back to the Future series are a good example of the tonality of these guys. Much later in the film, we actually hear them talking outside of anybody else's reach. So in other words, acting as they normally would, and they're just... They're just whatever, dude. Man, I love our job. You know, whoo, cool. And that, and that's it, right? That's the overall tonality. And that is the way they're portrayed consistently. This is also probably why Hopper's the one in charge, because he's the only one who uses his brain at all. Now, uh, I don't want to praise him too much, because Hopper, well, he's, he's, dan- he's dancing on the knife's edge, and he knows it, which is the interesting part. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So we find out that he's afraid of birds, we find out that Molt doesn't fit in. Hmm. We find out that he is effectively charging these people protection. You know, that's the, bra- the grasshopper's end of the deal. They protect you against the other bugs, which, of course, they obviously don't. And this then leads to an interesting scene, because he grabs Dot. Now, this is, this is messed up. because She's just a child, and he's obviously threatening her establishing his villainy, but it also establishes Flick. Flick may not actually do anything here, but it is worth noting that he is the only one who does anything here. He stands up and says, leave her alone. Her mother? Her sister? Her her fellow Blueberry camp people? Her teacher? Anyone else? No. No, no one. Everyone else just is like, okay, go ahead and threaten that innocent child. We'll just sit here and let you. Now, granted, Flick, again, doesn't really do anything. He simply stands up for her and then cowers back into his hole. But it does help distinguish him from the rest of the hive. And it says something about how much work Hopper has done to maintain his PR campaign of being this terrifying figure. That only Flick, the outsider, the guy who doesn't fit in, is willing to actually stand up at all. So, they leave. This then leads to them deciding punishment for Flick before they move on. They have a fake court thing. We get some quick and dirty exposition, as usual. No one's willing to help a bunch of ants. (laughs) 
This leads to an idea, and oh my god, I actually asked on my Discord, but no one could tell me the answer to this. Um, there's a phrase where you have an animal problem, so you release an animal to get rid of the other animal. But the new animal is worse, so you release another animal to get rid of that animal, which is even worse. And, and it, like, escalates up to gorillas or something, right? God, someone in the comment section, please tell me what I'm talking about, because it drove me batty. And uh, trying to find a phrase like that, or a, or a Aesop like that, was really hard to do just from straight Googling. Google's like, you mean this? No. But that's kind of what one of the problems is here, as suggested. Why don't you go and get someone bigger and badder than the grasshoppers to defend us? The thing is, that is a terrible idea. Nah, hear me out for a moment. First of all, on the one hand, it could go well, and they su could successfully get rid of Hopper and the grasshoppers. But if any of the grasshoppers survive, they will be able to leave, get reinforcements, come back, and we have issues. This is very step mentality here. The second problem, which is much worse, is you could release something much worse than the grasshoppers, like I was just alluding to. The Godzilla threshold, if you will. And in that circumstance, well, congratulations, now you're even more screwed, because at least you could probably have defeated the grasshoppers. But now you've got something even worse showing up and taking all your food. So this is a terrible idea. Naturally, they all think it's a great idea and send Flick off on it. I want you to th carefully think about something. Everyone, including the queen, who was shown as being one of the more positively inclined of the ants, and the princess, ditto, both think that it's a totally cool idea for Flick to leave and go and, and get this stuff. They also think that leaving the island is suicide. And every ant involved has, has consistently portrayed the idea of leaving the island as a terrifying thought. Partially because of Hopper's manipulations, but also because of the fact that they're so traditionalist that they literally don't know what's over the next hill. So who knows what could be out there? Very Fallout 1. So you put those two facts together and you see why I'm bringing this up here. Screw these ants. I'm sorry. It's, this is one of the reasons, we're up to I think reason number two now, why this movie kind of aggravates me a bit. It's like, what is wrong with these people? And we're supposed to root for them. I know, I know, the hero is supposed to be self-sacrificing to people who even hate them, but come on. <sighs> Anyways. Um, what? Oh, oh, right, right, right. Um, sorry, I was looking at my notes and being very confused by a note, and that's because I wrote it strangely. So what happens next is another one of those establishing things. Now, we've actually already seen this in Toy Story, but I think this is a better presentation of this. And this idea is something that would become a Pixar norm all the way up until Onward, which as of this moment of recording is the most recent Pixar film I've seen. I haven't seen Soul yet, so it'll be the first time watching it for the show. And that would be, okay, we've got Blink. How would Blink do normal human stuff? And we see this in Finding Nemo, we see this in Cars, we see this in Onward. It's a normal thing that Pixar likes to do. Okay, we've established a fantastical concept, let's add the mundane to it. Now, I like that. I like their approach to doing that, and I think it's a smart thing to do. And it allows for just from general creativity, just cool little things. I wrote down a couple of examples. Um, the stick bug being a prop, the fireflies being used as lamps, the Christmas lights being used as the red, red light, green light, the beetle being used as a bus... You get the idea. Mushrooms, you know, that's a thing. Just just quick and dirty stuff. There's not that many in this film, but again, establishing precedent. This also leads to Ratzenberger. I was going to make a Bill Paxton joke here. You're probably thinking, huh? And if you are, then you didn't see the aliens rumination. Shame on you. But the joke was going to go something along the lines of, Ratzenberger clearly has some dirt on the Pixar executives, and that's why he's in every film. And then I realized who the Pixar executives are and what the dirt is there. So thanks, real life, for completely ruining the joke. People. Regardless, while Ratzenberger was obviously in Toy Story 1 as Ham, this is once again establishing the trend. Ratzenberger is back. He's actually one of the only people who's back and voices the flea. Actually, one of his largest roles within the series of Pixar films. And this would become, begin what is effectively a running gag, a Ratzenberger always voicing someone. I think there's like three or four films that he's not in. Actually, I think it's closer to six, now that I'm thinking that out loud, but you get my point. Anyways, 
So, the circus. Uh, Flick is weirdly unafraid of anything going on here. But I do like how we're introduced to the circus people very quickly and efficiently. There's a lot of that quick, quick, efficient exposition in this film. As, well, a group of people who don't quite fit in. They're, they're known as failures, is specifically the word they use consistently. And they talk about how, well, they don't really have any home. Yeah, yacht attack. Yeah. Mm. They don't really have a home with the circus. They don't really have anywhere else to go. They do stick together as a group, but they're obviously, well, gypsies, right? They're outsiders. They're people who don't fit in, right? <laughs> so, uh, this is, I, that, that was a joke, by the way, because her name is Gypsy. Anyways. <clears throat> So they put on, they put on the tribute pile right back on the edge. Um, this is reinforced, by the way. Um, hang on, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. A lot of stuff happens very quickly, and I don't have much to say about it. We see Francis, who is being teased about being feminine for some reason. I guess it's because he's a ladybug. And we see the flies, who are like, and they're bullies because they're flies. Nobody, nobody likes flies, honestly. I mean, can you imagine trying to make a lovable cockroach in a film? Give me a break. And then we see, you know, the, the misunderstanding and Flick is shoved out. I mentioned Flick isn't really afraid. While he obviously does have fear, he doesn't have traditional fear. He's not as uh, cloistered is the word I would probably use as most of his fellows. That's because Flick is crazy. I don't actually mean that as a negative thing. In fact, if I'm being completely honest, I tend to think of crazy as a positive character trait. But he is someone who is obviously crazy. He's totally cool with all of this and just charging ahead full steam. He hires them, and they're like, yeah, thank God, a job. We'll take any job, especially if the flies are waking up. And then he explains everything to tuck and roll, and not to anyone else. Yeah. So, Princess Ada, remind you, she is shown as to being one of the more positively inclined ants, is wigged out about this whole situation and thinks there's something wrong. And, oh, by the way, she is consistently afraid of the idea of fighting the grasshoppers. Just the concept of fighting them terrifies her. This is either A, showing how effective Hopper has been, or B, showing how traditionalist they really are, or C, all of the above. Take your pick. Now... I don't like Cassandra Truths. In fact, I hate them. And I don't like misunderstandings based on lies. So this this section of the film kind of falls a little flat for me, but I forgot how quick it was. So I'll give the, the film credit. They quickly, and efficiently, find out, oh, oh, you, you want us to fight. Oh, oh, we're out. We're out. We are so out. I gotta say, by the way, the school play they put on is probably better in both production value and acting quality than most of the school plays I've both been in and seen in my life. Ants. Ants for thespians, yo. Anywho. <clears throat> so they flee. Yep. Then they encounter the T-Rex. I'm sorry. They encounter the bird. And it shows the type of threats that exist within this kind of setup. Once again... Perspective and context is key. I talked about this during Toy Story 1. Simply a nice little innocent bird is a terrifying existential threat, effectively a T-Rex, to these bugs. And only by working together as a group do they barely escape this thing. They don't defeat it. In fact, they never defeat this bird. They can't. And that helps to emphasize it. Once again, showing that context is key. I also want to point out how, once again, we have a bit of a D&D &D group thing. We had a little bit of that in, in Toy Story 1, but that was mostly with the, the misfit toys, the ones that were taken apart and put together by Sid. Here we see a similar thing. Each of these insects has their own little talents and skills, which, when working together, can accomplish some cool stuff. Either way, oh, they also have good teamwork, despite their earlier mishaps. Frankly, I think most of their earlier mishaps could be placed on P.T. Barnum than anything else. Or P.T. Flea, excuse me, whatever his name is. It is P.T. Flea, I'm sorry. Ratzenberg. Anywho, so let's see. We've got Flick, who's an outcast. We've got Molt, who's an outcast. We've got the circuit bugs, circus bugs who are outcasts. We've got Ada, who is, and I quote, just everyone is standing there waiting for you to screw up. Hashtag relatable. How many of you, real talk, you don't have to answer in the comments, how many of you remember embarrassing things you did decades ago? How many of you are still embarrassed by them? 
that idea, that feeling of, of being not quite fitting in is something that I relate to probably more than I should because I'm the guy who gets along with everybody. But it's something I do feel and have seen many, many times, and it is clearly the dominant theme of the film overall, that the people who don't quite fit in, well, only don't fit in because they haven't been given a chance. That's the key point, and that's the consistent point. Even with Molt, who is someone who's not that terrible, he's just kind of a stumbling guy who's got a low self-esteem issue and therefore is, feels ground down, so he screws up. Here, like, Does this sound familiar? Because you could take so many of the character traits of Molt and Flick and put them side by side, and they would fit almost one-to-one. -one. If Hopper or the other grasshoppers had given Molt a chance, he'd probably be able to relax and be more himself and be a relatively more decent and accepted member of the group. Same thing with Flick, same thing with Ada, same thing with the circus bugs. There's actually more. Dot is one of those as well. Dot is consistently shown as being someone who doesn't really fit in, despite the fact that she's actually from Kingdom Hearts. Yes, that's right. This is our first connection between Kingdom Hearts and Pixar, right here in A Bug's Life. If you think I'm kidding, the, the girl who voiced Dot eventually would go on to voice Kyrie in the early Kingdom Hearts stuff. She would, unfortunately, later be replaced, but fact remains. Just thought I'd share that little tidbit. Nihu. So, okay. The outcasts decide to band together. They get this great idea. And what we have is, is a montage. It's a good montage, though. There's also some really good storyboarding as Flick starts to explain to the group, which transitions to Manny explaining to the ants, which transitions to Ada explaining to the colony of exactly the plan. We effectively get three speeches condensed into one to get one bit of exposition out to the audience. Smart. Very smart storyboarding. As much as I do make fun of this script, it is quick and efficient. So, they uh, consistently use tech during this sequence. This is the bit I took away from it most. They are willing to let go of traditionalism, not only to do this plan in general, but in how they go about it. Um, they have the leaf blueprint. They have the megaphone, which they use. They use the mushrooms as the signals. The bird itself is obviously a technological thing. And what they do is they showcase that almost immediately after this, they stop using tech until a certain scene later in which they realize the plan is going ahead and then they start using it again almost immediately thereafter. And obviously in the finale, when, when the movie's ending, they're using the, they're all using the, the modified devices to chop down the food more quickly and efficiently because, well, because all they needed was the support. Of the, all, all the new technology needed was the support and financing and backing of the group in order to be able to be made feasible. You can see why I call this overall film kind of an allegory for Pixar as a whole, right? Anyways. So, the grasshoppers, we cut over to them. And the grasshoppers are abusing the mosquitoes just like they do the ants. I find myself wondering if there's like a, a, a group every season that he goes to and just... Uh, well, there's no nice way to say this. Hopper is a tyrant. Not a dictator. A tyrant. He understands a little bit disturbingly well exactly what a tyrant needs to do to stay in power. You need to constantly and consistently grind the people under your feet, even if there's no real benefit to it, because they need to always know their place. No one can ever be allowed to question you or your orders. Otherwise, the peasants will rise up, the serfs will attack, and you'll have a lot of people under a guillotine. This is something that is so much historical precedent, it's actually silly how common this is within human history. And what usually happens is the oppressor pushes and pushes and pushes until they, they push past a boundary to the point where it is now so, so being, they're so oppressed that it's actually worse to continue being oppressed than to fight back. And once that threshold is jumped over, well, then the pushback usually happens. Sometimes that leads to a revolution. Sometimes it leads to a failed revolution. It, this is a very common pattern in human history. Now, uh, he's obviously thinking, we can't let this go at all. Duh. But um, I want to point out that this is probably, I'd say, the most establishing moment for Hopper. It is also, ironically, one of my favorite scenes in the whole film. I'd say my third favorite scene in the whole film. Because he straight up murders three of his own guys just to make a point. 
And as he's he's standing there, just glaring at them as he's waiting for the for the seeds to finish coming out and burying them. Those ants outnumber us a hundred to one. <laughs> it is interesting, though, because most real life historical tyrants, as well as villains in fiction who fill the same role, tend to not be aware of the precariousness of their situation. This is what salvages Hopper for me. I, he is actually fully cognizant of the uncertain imbalance of his scenario and knows that he, he can't maintain it unless he constantly maintains it. And so we're going back. So there they go. You'll notice, by the way, he pulls the exact same trick in his own people here. By oppressing those three, he maintains control over the group, which is overall clearly in favor of not going back. Anywho, <clears throat> so... P.T. Flea shows up and ruins everything. <sighs> and it's like, oh, no. They're, they're, uh, this irritates the crap out of me. It's probably my least favorite scene in the whole film. Now, obviously, Ad is upset at Flick and has a reason to be so. He did lie. But if I might take his side for a second, the reason he lied is the exact reaction you're having right now, princess. I brought back some fleet circus people, but we've got a great idea to make this work. And she would have just been like, no. Just like they're all like, no. They all immediately torpedo all of the ideas, all of the bonding they've made with these people, all of the, the, the connections they've made with them. They have the bird. They have the plan. They have the setup. But they all abandon all of it. Why? Oh, well, you know, they're circus freaks instead of mercs. So outsiders couldn't possibly help us they're not part of the group now there is a validity to this because morale is an important thing but this is something that's always pissed me off in fiction <sighs> hang on hi i'm a, sw uh, a swiffer and i'm a beard comb we get along great and everything's awesome wait a second i just found out you're a beard comb I suddenly distrust all of the time and effort we spent bonding and getting together because your true nature has been revealed to me and that totally changes the reality of what we've already personally experienced just before. I hate this. I hate this. I'm sure it happens in real life. I've actually never seen this happen in real life personally. But I'm sure it does. But that is exactly what's happening here. Oh, they're circus bugs. Well, that's the end of that. And all of their faith in Flick, and all of the faith in the plan is gone. So now it's back to dinosaur mode <sighs> this leads to hopper showing up the grasshoppers are actually pretty coordinated here in how they systemically terrorize the ants into submission probably because that's the whole reason they're here as i mentioned earlier it's interesting though that they show such keen teamwork and organization skills because the ants can do exactly that too and show that in almost every scene they're in so it's not like they couldn't fight back if they wanted to but you know dot flees thumper has to fly thumper is totally cool with killing a child by the way i just wanted to point that out and this is actually where i make my note about the Kyrie connection let's talk about defeatism so defeatism is terrifying because defeatism is when you don't try. Well, there's no point in bothering. After all, I will not succeed. So you don't even get started. You know, the, the car doesn't get going and you don't get... It, 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 you don't even begin, right? Now, obviously, that is... There are good reasons to not begin a project or not begin an endeavor or whatever, right? There, there are good reasons to do that. But defeatism, feeling and thinking that you're going to fail before you even get out of the gate... That is a very unique and horrifying slice of depression. It ensures that you don't try things, which ensures that you don't succeed at things, which further ensures that you don't try things. It's very seesaw. And the further you tilt, the further you tilt. And that leads to, a, well, Flick and his entire character arc, actually. It is interesting that the entirety of the circus group Minus Flea, because Flea's always ruining everything. And Dot all have to work together to try and convince him just to try. Just to make the endeavor. To make the effort. This also leads to a first for me in the Pixar films. 
I'm going to take a sidebar here really quick, okay? One of the things that Pixar is very well known for now is the feels. Uh, this probably, for me, peaked around up. But even their films that aren't really all that good, like Onward, still have extremely impacting, wonderful emotional scenes that just... They managed to knife right into the feels, right? It's actually a meme at this point. The Pixar runs on tears, right? And they're really good at that. But Toy Story didn't have that. And I found myself thinking, when did that start? Now, obviously, Up was a big moment. But I'm, I'm during this particular run-through of the franchise, I actually plan to pay attention and try and track when that kind of became a Pixar norm. But this scene where Dot pulls up the rock and is like, pretend it's a seed, okay? That was the first moment I felt like that as I've been going through the series. And I know, we're only on the second film. It's not quite to the same extent as the other stuff, but I think this might be the proto-feels moment right here. Curious of your thoughts on this, and as ever, curious when the first feels moment would be for you. You don't have to answer here. If it happens in a future film, you could mention it there. Again, I do plan to track these as we go. Either way, so they decide to go distract him. And this, can I, can I tell a side story? So they, they, they'd send the circus up and they're like, hey, hey, we're a distraction. One time I was in Warsong Gulch and I'm running around like a maniac, typing out in all caps. I was on a paladin. I'm a distraction. I'm a distraction. And going around stunning and slowing and, you know, flinging all this stuff. This was back during uh, Vanilla, I believe. Yeah, it was. This is during Vanilla. And so just running around constantly and interrupting the horde enemies that were coming after me. And it worked really well. I was a very good distraction, and I was very good at tying up the enemy. Because sometimes the most overt distractions tend to be the best. So they roll up with a large da 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 circus thing. And it works quite well. This leads to uh, problem one with the well actually before we get to the problem one of the plan let's talk about the Godzilla threshold now i mentioned this in passing earlier but there is a, a slight difference between the Godzilla threshold and the animal problem i talked about earlier the Godzilla threshold is things are so bad we're willing to try stuff we normally wouldn't whereas the animal problem i mentioned earlier is usually done in ignorance making things worse because you are frantically trying to make things better the Godzilla threshold is well we're screwed anyways release Godzilla Hence the name. That's kind of what they go through here. All of the ants, even the, just the random ones off to the side, all are completely on board with the plan that they previously, mo previously mocked and hated. Why? Things couldn't possibly get worse at this point, so screw it. And it's interesting the way they portray that, because it's clearly shown that this isn't sudden faith in the plan or sudden faith in Flick. It's just, oh god, things are much worse than we thought. Well, might as well try, right? So they send up the the ants to free the bird. Problem number one, the bird gets stuck. How do they fix that? Well, first the ants try to move the rock. It doesn't work out that well. But then they use technology to move the rock. Huh. This is, again, the traditionalism theme, the dinosaur theme of the entire work, that people you know who are willing to try something new tend to accomplish something better. Cool. So, and uh, everyone likes to play along. There's some great stuff. Oh, my eye, my eye. It's just an enjoyable overall sequence, and everyone plays it up. And that helps sell it. What's doubly amusing from a narrative perspective here, this is almost irony, is that if you're paying attention, the ants and circus bugs are pulling the exact same trick on Hopper that he has been pulling on them for years by playing it up. By using PR, by using intimidation and coordination, they are selling an idea that isn't actually true to him. Now, this then leads to P.T. Flea ruining everything for the third time. I swear to God, he is the Mr. Potato Head of this frickin' film. <sighs> if I haven't said this before, allow me to say once again without hyperbole that Mr. Potato Head was the villain of Toy Story 1. I am not joking about that. That's not some meme. He is actually the most villainous character in that entire film, and it pissed me off. It's one of the biggest detriments to that film. And P.T. Flea is kind of going in the same direction here. This then leads to the reveal. You'll notice, however, because of the distraction, they have won a victory. This is key and critical. I'd say a little over half of the grasshoppers left. 
he's left with only a small handful. Uh, I should have paused and counted, but it can't be more than 12. It's probably close to like 9 or 8. And that's all he's got left, because everyone else ran. Because bird, right? Now, that's important because it means now they are on a worse standing than they were before, and they were already in a state where they had to constantly terrorize their enemy in order to win. So the bird wasn't for nothing. I'll give you that one, Fel. Then he beats the ever-living snot out of Flick. And no one tries to help. They don't really try to help until Flick starts speechifying and starts talking about what the ants can accomplish and basically pulls Hopper's trick one last time in reverse. We can do so much more than you give us credit for. You'll notice Hopper has been doubling down hard here. You're less than dirt. You're an ant. You have no purpose and you're worthless and blah, blah, blah. Really trying to hammer in the PR stint, the terrorization, the ty- tyranny that he has been pushing for years because he's trying to reestablish control. The problem is when you're pushing the element that hard, it's actually flimsier. This is also historically true. When you really oppress someone, you tend to have less success oppressing them. This is hell. This is even true in Star Wars, for God's sakes. So, he is able to turn that around on Hopper and convince the ants of what's going on. This then leads to the big battle scene. Now, there's a brilliant shot. There's some good camera work in this film. Where Hopper is realizing that he's losing the crowd and he's losing the tyranny battle. And as he turns, he sees so many ants, a sea of ants, that literally you can't see the ground between them for how many are just covering the screen and then they charge and as they're charging the new ants come in and continue to cover the screen because there are that many of them nice touch this then leads to them curb stopping the grasshoppers and hopper because of course they are in real life if a grasshopper tried to infiltrate an ant farm or an ant hill or whatever actually (laughs) the ants would absolutely shred that grasshopper this leads to our third problem. Pay attention. The first problem was the bird was stuck. The second problem was Mr. Flea. The third problem is the rain. Now, this is not quite the first, but this is in many ways the first time an environmental threat has been portrayed as a major villainous force within these films. You could argue that the traffic at the end of Toy Story 1 would qualify. That's why I kind of asterisked that. But this will also become a fairly regular Pixar thing. And... If I might sidebar for just a second, I think that's a good move. Oh, a good villain's a good villain, and a good villain has their purpose and point, but there's also something to be said about the environmental threat. Not only is it more terrifying because of how, frankly, more existential it is, watching a volcano go off right in front of you, for example, or a hurricane that's on approach, there's just a terror to that, right? But more to the point, it also helps sell the film in a way that doesn't require evil. Because there's no evil behind a volcano, no evil behind a hurricane. It's just something that is. It's actually more Lovecraftian in its own way, because it doesn't know you exist, and it doesn't care. So, using the rain in this manner was actually quite brilliant. It also, if you're paying attention, manages to use a classic film trope, rain during the finale, except in a different way. Rather than it being something that is purely atmospheric and setting the tone, it literally becomes part of the threat that they're facing towards the end. Nice touch. So, <clears throat> they go after Hopper. Uh, some stuff happens. The team manages to delay him. Ada saves him. Flick remembers the location. They go over to the bird, and Hopper dies, screaming. Now, I haven't seen all the Pixar films, as I've pointed out before, but off the top of my head, I can't think of any Pixar villain who dies a more horrifying death than Hopper. The only one that comes to mind immediately is Syndrome over in The Incredibles 1. If you can think of any, I'm curious, because this is a horrific death. He probably is being ripped apart while he's still alive. (laughs) Do I feel bad about that? No, he was a tyrant. I mean, he literally had a reign of terror, for God's sakes. Anyways, so, uh, the the film kind of wraps up. Heimlich is now a butterfly. Francis has accepted his motherly instincts. Molt gets a slightly less demeaning job. Uh, the uh, You'll notice the island is doing noticeably better. 
Now, on the one hand, that might be seen as a Lion King thing. But on the other hand, I actually totally believe that because they're now pulling away much less food and resources from the island, which means the island itself can then restore and rejuvenate itself better and thus has a better cycle going on because they're no longer you know, resource ripping out of this place to feed the grasshoppers every cycle, right? Also, it's spring, so flowers. Gotta have flowers. I love the rock gag. Earlier on, you know, the scene that had the feels. Pretend it's a pretend it's a seed, okay? And so when they're leaving, they give a rock to the princess. And they're... What is, it must be a circus thing. You got me there. It's probably one of the only times I actually laughed in this film. And we end on a zoom out. One more thing. One more establishing moment that establishes a trend for the Pixar films going forward. The mid-credits scene. Now, the mid-credits scenes have taken several different forms over the course of Pixar's history. Sometimes they're just other stuff happening in the world. Sometimes it's a little bit of world-building or character moments. Or like it's an outro, like in WALL-E, for example, where it kind of follows through and serves as an epilogue. And sometimes it's outtakes, like we have here, where... Uh, where they, they, you know, they just throw in some random gags that they thought of. I remember seeing this in the theaters and being enjoyed, you know, being enjoyed, being entertained as I enjoyed the whole film. But the first time I started actually laughing out loud was during these outtakes. They caught me several times. And I'll, I'll give you that one film. I do love the outtakes. And I guess we'll see more of those going forwards. I'm almost into that. Wow, this is the end of the book. I have one more page, and that's not going to be enough for Toy Story 2. I do, as ever, hope you have enjoyed my thoughts. I'll see you next time.